Okay, well, we're, we're going to begin where we always uh, begin with the three questions that we ask uh, every guest in our Timothy series. Uh, and it's maybe just sort of good to start at the beginning of the pastoral ministry. Uh, the first thing we ask everyone is, is how did you discern a call to pastoral ministry? When did you begin to sense and, and how did you sense, uh, see this, this call sort of come about? Uh, I could give you the short version, the long version, or somewhere in between. Maybe I'll go somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, for me, looking back, it was fairly closely connected to my conversion, I think. In, in other words, let me just tell you the story and then tell you what I think this means for folk trying to discern that call. For me, I grew up in um, a Bible-believing um, Church of England home. So I was taught the Bible from a young age. I made a profession of faith about eight, and then I kept on going over what was in pencil in pen about 50 times a week. If you were, grew up in a Christian home, maybe you had the same experience of recommitment or whatever. So I did that for a long time and really struggled with a sense of sin, of forgiveness, until uh, the age of 13 when God stepped remarkably and wonderfully into my life and really changed my life. So that's closely connected to my conversion. How do you think that trajectory, sort of the timeline works in terms of when I got converted, just laying it out for you like that. But very soon after I was 13, I went to a, a sort of old-fashioned English boarding school. So there was a chapel, and everyone had to go to chapel, and so there were 500 kids there. And there I am, 13, 13, 14, something like that. And for some reason, I have the opportunity to give the chapel sermon that morning. And so I preach on Ecclesiastes, because I don't know any better, and that's a hard book. <laughs> and, and I preach on the end of it saying, you know, nothing really matters other than fearing God, etc. And it was a strange experience. I still remember it, because I remember getting down. I was incredibly nervous before I did it. But I remember getting down thinking, hmm, something seems to be at work that isn't me. Uh, and I didn't know how to categorize that, what that meant, but it seemed as if something was going on that wasn't purely me. Um, put that to the back of my mind, I was a fairly normal kid, I think, sort of, and um, went up to Cambridge as an undergraduate to do history, and my career track intention at that point was to do history as an undergraduate and then do what they call a law conversion course and become a lawyer. I wanted to be a barrister in London. Anyone know what that is? Barrister? Yeah, so it's, it's like a trial lawyer, basically, in, in London. And I really thought that'd be fun, because if you're a barrister, you just get the brief from the solicitor, and then you have to walk into court, and then you, you go for it. It's real fly by the seat of your pants kind of thing, and I enjoy that. So I was very much into that. But then when I was at Cambridge, I got involved in a ton of evangelism, telling all my friends about Jesus, and I got asked to be president of this organization called Kick You, uh, the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union, a strange acronym. Oxford is called OIQ, and Cambridge KICQ, and there are others that are even worse that I'll leave to your imagination. Um, but, then, but I did that, and that was a real turning point for me, because I knew, the way I was thinking about it at least, I knew if I did that, I probably was not going to be a barrister, because it was a known evangelical organization on campus, fairly well known among those who know what happens at Cambridge, and it would kind of... Um, skew my pitch in terms of getting into a good training program to be a lawyer. It'd also be incredibly busy, and I just have no time. And so it was a real turning point for me. And so that, that was the first kind of little way that God turned me. And then I did some uh, foreign mission work. I did some pastoral work in London. Came back to Cambridge because I thought to myself, inside myself, if I'm going to keep on doing this thing called ministry, I'm going to need some more theological training decided, well, not everyone should do a PhD at Cambridge to get more theological training, but um, I probably could, and so maybe I should, just because it might be something that God could use in his kingdom. So I did that, got very involved in a local church there as well, ended up running their college ministry, and then having God sort of turn me to take a step towards ministry in one way or another, full-time Christian ministry, I then was presented with sort of three options. Do I do academic work? Do I do mission work, because I've done some of both of those, or do I go into pastoral uh, Bible teaching uh, ministry? 
And the, the kind of final nail in the coffin for me, if you like, that's not a bad metaphor for going to pastoral ministry, but the final nail in the coffin was um, one of the elders at that church um, <coughs> preached in the evening service. And he didn't normally preach, but he preached in the evening service. And he preached on Peter's reinstatement uh, from Jesus. And for me, the way that God used that in my life is he asked if you love me, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, feed my sheep. I took that as a clear call from God that that was, that was the specific, specific way that God wanted me to serve him. And so then I went into pastoral ministry. So it was, a, it was closely connected to my conversion, and yet God gradually worked that out. And I don't think at 14 I knew where I was going to be God gradually worked that out. Okay. So what I think that means in terms of discerning the call is it's easy for us on the other side of the fence to say, you've got to have this dramatic call from God. And I think that's discouraging. Some people have it, a lot of people don't. Uh, on the other hand, I, I also think that, that, that there is something called a call, Acts 14, um, uh, the... Uh, the, the, the um, uh, the, the Paul and Barnabas set aside by the Church of Antioch for which the task to which the Holy Spirit is calling them. I think there is something called a call. I think it's an internal sense of, hmm, this could be what God wants me to do. And I think that internal call needs to be matched by an external call, that is from the local church. And when those two together, I think you have a healthy work of God. So something internal and then affirmed by the community yep. together. This next question, I'm um, excited to hear your answer Okay. Um, after the message today. Is this Cubs or Sox? Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, as a pastor, what current sociological or cultural trends mm. are you observing that are impacting the way you do ministry now um, mm. and uh, that you think our students need to be aware of? Sociological or cultural, cultural trends. Cultural trends. Yeah. Well, I think to some extent that's different depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. And it may be different in your corner of the woods than mine. And it was certainly a little different in New England and a little different in England. And it's certainly a little different in Wheaton. Um, and so uh, there are particularities. I, it's a, you know, uh, in general, uh, addressing your question, which is a great question, uh, it seems to me there are two issues that I think are right uh, at the heart of what we need to be addressing today. Number one is the issue of postmodernity, which we've been talking about for 10 years and is so boring to talk about, and relativism and you know, everyone thinking you can have whatever cake or whatever god you like and that's fine, <coughs> etc., etc. It's been around for a long time, but it's now, I think, become the sort of default mode. About 10 years ago, it was sort of exciting. What does it mean? And now it's just everyone assumes that's life. And so postmodernity and the challenge of that to the biblical Christianity, particularly issues of ethics, uh, that is, you know, is it really right and moral to be a biblical Christian and be against homosexual practice and believe that Jesus is the only way to God? Uh, that's a big question out there. We need to be able to answer that and address that. So the, the whole realm of postmodernity. And then on the other side, uh, that's the kind of external or the, the challenge in the world, I suppose, within the church, though that impacts the church in all sorts of ways. Within the church, it seems to me there's a challenge of nominalism, evangelical nominalism, in that for some folk, the heritage of uh, a Billy Graham or a John Stott or um, Carl Henry um, has become assumed. And, and it's a great heritage, but once we assume it, uh, we are not that far from no longer having it. Mm. So I think every generation of the church has to go through, as I talked about this morning, that Billy Graham moment, I suppose, or, and you can see that in the lives of all the, the great Christian leaders, a moment of, of crisis that turns in the direction of faithfulness uh, away from worldliness in one way or another. But, but because of this great heritage, we can assume that instead every generation kind of has to fight for it. We have to fight for the truth of the gospel, that we're justified by faith alone. We have to fight for it's only through Jesus. We have to fight for the authority of the Bible. 
Because these things, when they're assumed, very quickly drift. So I think those are the two challenges, post-modernity and evangelical nominalism okay. in general. But it looks different in every place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question is really yeah. two questions, A and B. Mm. First of all, could you tell us about uh, your high point in ministry? As you think about your years in ministry, what is, really, is, is there one point that you could say that, that was really the high point? Um, so far. Like a single moment? A single moment or a, per a time period perhaps. Can I have two? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, one is a long time ago, but I think has been very significant for me and formative in terms of believing that God can do things that are beyond our expected norms. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was at this boarding school, there was an evangelical chaplain who brought in an evangelist who preached to this school of, you know, nominally speaking Anglican, but basically agnostic people, 500 or so. He came in and gave these hot hellfire sermons for a week, which just you no know, one really knew what to do with. Uh, and so this school 500, w beforehand there was an evangelical Christian meeting, which was called School Christian Union Meeting, <laughs> or SCUM <laughs> for short, which was unfortunate to say the least. And there were three people who went to this each week, you see. And at the end of this week, we all gathered together and there were 103. Mm. And I think because of that experience, I've never really looked at a situation which seems dead and dying and impossible and thought, well, this is pointless. No one could do this. I think because of that early experience, God graciously gave me a window into what well, it is obvious that God could do anything, but to have seen that, mm -hmm. I think has been very uh, formative for me in ministry. Mm -hmm. So there's that one. The other one, I think, is the experience at the church where I was most recently at Trinity in New Haven next to Yale, which when we arrived was 20 people with uh, you know, um, without a building, and, you know, those 20 people, I mean, it really was 20. This, this isn't dramatic numbers. It was 20 people, you know, <laughs> maybe 25, but you know what I mean? And, um, and then just going there with no, you know, just trusting God, really, mm -hmm. on both sides, mm -hmm. and seeing God transform that community to be a thriving, um, for New Haven, large, mm -hmm. I mean, really significant, um, with its own building completely paid off mm -hmm. right next to Yale, to seeing God do that mm -hmm. is, is, very, is very amazing. Having mm -hmm. said that, it was really hard too. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm really excited about the ministry now at College Church in Wheaton. Uh, it's going really well. We seem to be growing. People seem to be really excited. There's a very important sort of uh, ministry um, battle in the heartland of the Bible Belt that I think God has sent me there to be a part of. Um, but I've only been there 10 months, mm -hmm. so it's hard to tell a long story about it yet. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, um, what would be the low point? Uh, obviously, there are some that are personal that you probably wouldn't feel comfortable sharing. But oh, sure, you're all friends. Yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> As you reflect on your years in ministry, what is there a point that you say that was really the most difficult point? I think if I'm going to be honest, I also have to hide the names of the, of the, of the guilty at the same time. But I would like to be, have integrity and just be open, so let me do that. I think the hardest thing for me has been when people in positions of responsibility and gospel authority cave in. Mm. And I've seen that a couple of times, and it's very hard, mm -hmm. I find. And I think Paul, when he talks about his ministry, you know, they've all abandoned me. Not that's, that hasn't happened to me, but, you know, in the area of Ephesus, et cetera, he's, he's talking about that. Um, that is really hard. Mm -hmm. I guess it's obvious why it's hard, but yeah. it is. Yeah. And I've seen that a couple of times. Okay. That actually is, uh, I think, almost every person we've had 
here for the Timothy, Timothy series. Really? They've mentioned that that's been the most difficult thing for them when those who have come alongside them in ministry have fallen. Uh, it's the most difficult time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, no pizza yet. Um, so. Uh, Man does oh, not live here. on pizza alone. Oh, he does. Oh, good. Okay. Sure. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll run the mic to you. If you don't mind, please wait so your questions can be recorded so that uh, Dr. Moody doesn't have to repeat the question before he answers. And I thought I would start things off by asking a question just based on my knowledge of you, Josh, as a person. It seems like a lot of your ministry has been done in college towns, I mean, real significant college towns. Yeah. And I know there are some intellectually inclined ministers here and pastors in training here who might like someday to serve in a college town. Can you say some things that might be helpful to them about your experience, frustrations, uh, wisdom that's been gained through hard knocks and so on about uh, faithful ministry in a college town, and maybe even some things about the differences between serving in a college town like New Haven on the one hand and serving in a very different college town like Wheaton on the other yeah. hand. Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, one of the key things is that if you go to pastor a church in a college town, you're not going because really you want to be a professor. Uh, you have to want to be a pastor. And that's really important because otherwise, you know, there are always going to be people in your church who are not part of the college, right? And if they feel that you're only really there so that you can kind of talk lots of really cool intellectual jargon and hang out with intellectuals, uh, it's going to make your ministry pretty difficult. So it doesn't mean you can't love intellectual things, but you have to be cool to be a pastor in that context. And so both town and gown have to have your heart. And then that's expressed in all sorts of ways. But I think people intuitively pick up whether it's like, you know, there's a, there's a homeless person or there's a you know, average guy with his family, and here's someone who's doing a PhD, you know, I'm really excited. Um, but you have to be as excited about, this is a homeless guy, and, and his life is going to get changed around, and he's going to become a Christian. He's no longer going to be doing crack. Wow. Now, he may never write a PhD, but he's no longer going to be good doing crack, and that's great, too. You know, and here's a guy, and he's doing a PhD, and he thinks he's really smart, and he probably isn't as smart as he thinks he is, but, you know... And, and, and so there you are, and he, maybe he'll go someplace and have real influence for God in some seminary or university, and that's great too. But you have to, both those things have to have your heart. And I think the way to do that is because you're called to be a pastor, a Bible-teaching pastor, rather than a professor. If you're called to be a professor, just be one. You know, That's good too. Um, but uh, I think that's the key thing. Um, and uh, in terms of the differences between Cambridge and New Haven, Yale, and Wheaton, well, uh, uh, yeah, this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> They're very different. Um, obviously, Cambridge is a sort of first-class university with a lot of um, secular influence, and yet Cambridge, if you had a Bible Belt in England, Cambridge, Oxford, London would probably be it, a kind of triangle. And so there are a lot of very strong churches there as well, which is sort of a different paradigm for Americans to get their head around, I think. Uh, New Haven obviously has, you know, a world-class university there too, but there are, there are good churches there, but it's, it's not the Bible Belt. Uh, Wheaton kind of is the Bible Belt with a capital B, capital, capital B, capital B. Um, and, and so that's, that's different. <laughs> They're all good. It's just different. <laughs> well, you know, this, I guess in terms of the two parallel issues, you know, if you're, if you're a place like New Haven, then the postmodern challenge is right at the forefront. And you're trying to equip people to deal with that. And you're trying to also help them not get into evangelical normalism as well. Whereas your place like Wheaton, the evangelical normalism thing is much more front and center, and you're trying to equip people to deal with postmodernism as well. So I guess it's which, which is at the front. Um. 
questions? Dr. Moody, this morning uh, in chapel, you mentioned the importance of mentors. Yeah. And I, I was curious who have been uh, or who has been a, a significant living mentor for you? How, how did that relationship come about? And, and maybe what's, what's something that you've learned from that? Probably my most significant mentor is my father. Uh, we went on one elders retreat once. And we were all sitting around together. And the elder, one of the elders decided to ask, who is your ultimate father figure, you see? And I said, well, I think it's my father. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm blessed with a very good dad, very godly. Uh, he um, went to Cambridge too. I come from an overly intellectual background. My dad went to Cambridge. My brother went to Cambridge. I went to Cambridge. My other brother went to Oxford. <laughs> um, so we, uh, and he always would talk about, you know, the sermon, not in a kind of roast the pastor experience, but edifying, and it was, I never was at a place where I thought that the, there was really a really serious intellectual challenge to Christianity, just because of who my dad was and the conversations we had. Um, he uh, taught in uh, what you would call private schools all his career. Uh, he uh, was a headmaster of a private school at the end, a uh, very gifted leader, and uh, great credibility as a person. Um, I mean, he has his faults, like we all do but he's probably the most significant mentor I've had. Pizza is here. <laughs> Changing the topic briefly. Uh, there have been many others as well, many others who have been very significant in my life. Um, so, but that's probably the, the main one. Uh, Dr. Moody, I was wondering if you could just, sorry, hiding oh. behind these heads. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a story about your family. Um, maybe tell us a story about a time where you struggled with balancing your responsibilities and priorities as a pastor mm. with maybe priorities of being a husband or a father. Um, so maybe just a story from your life where you worked through that. Yeah. This is great because my wife isn't here, so I can sound like I've got it completely sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded. Oh, yeah, right, right. Um, well, in our first year of marriage, I I'm a little overdriven as a person. I always have been. Um, always, as long as I can remember, I have been. And, and so in our first year of marriage, I decided I would um, take a, um, you know, um, make some changes, because now I'm married. And so before I got married, I, I used to work from 6 in the morning to 12 at night. I was doing a PhD. I was also mentoring a bunch of students. I was running a college ministry that grew. Uh, and I was also doing pioneer mission work in Azerbaijan and Georgia in the former Soviet Union. And so what I do is I work on my PhD in the morning, 6 until 1 o'clock, lunchtime. And in the afternoon, I mentor a bunch of students and do a bit of administration for one program or another. And then there will be supper. And then I work on my PhD until midnight. And that was my schedule. See, So now I'm married. I've got to change. <laughs> so Rochelle finds this very funny in, in retrospect. So I decide I am going to stop working at 11. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't do that anymore. Um, but she was very patient with me and allowed me to figure that out gradually. Um, what I do now is I try and get to the, you know, I get into the office early, I work, I try and get home for the dinner bedtime experience. And so that's a couple of hours now. It's from sort of 5, 5.30 till 7, 7.30. And I try and be home for that. I've got young kids. If dad's around then, that's a very significant investment. I also, not to make myself look completely terrible in this regard, I also, quite early, before I was married, programmed myself when I was writing sermons to be able to um, psychologically, as it were, feel that they were done enough by Friday evening to take Saturday as a potential family day for when I got married. And that takes a lot of getting used to. But I did that for years, and so now I try and get my manuscript done by Friday night, and the Saturday I try and spend with my family as much as possible. So I have Monday as my day off, but I try and have Saturday when possible with my family, because if Monday's my day off, the kids are at school. So and that, that I think, I hope that's going to help. Um, I tend to do the bedtime thing, which means I tend to do the devotional thing with the kids. 
Um, and we do that together. Just got two children now, another on the way. And then I, then I pray with them individually as they go to sleep. So there's a sort of personal shepherding dad touch as well as, hey, you need to sit still because we're reading the Bible, you know. Um, which isn't always the most edifying experience, I think, for devotions for many families. Um, uh, I am fairly strict in principle that, that I must not let my family be the false, uh, must not let my ministry be the false god Baal on which I sacrifice my family. I, I do not want to get to the end of my ministry and have built up some big churches and preached in some places and done some good stuff and then find my children do not believe in Jesus. And I don't know how well I'm going to do it, but I'm trying to put some things in place so that they get that. And I, I think that principle is important. Somehow in our hearts as dads, as parents in ministry, we have to decide that if this means my family being healthy, this means that I'm not going to get all the plaudits that otherwise I might get because I could put some more hours in then I'm not going to get them. And I think if we don't make that decision, we're really making an idol of ministry. It's one of the ways I try and figure out whether it's becoming idolatrous to me. Um, <laughs> hey, Josh. Yeah. I was wondering why in the world you moved away from New England. You need to go back there. Yeah. <laughs> He's from Boston. <laughs> I'm from Boston. Yeah. No, for real, I, um, I was wondering, with all the different needs in our country, with all the different needs across the world, how did you, beginning, how did you decide what to prioritize in your efforts for the gospel? Um, how did you decide what, what needs to work yourself into, you know, what to put your guts into? Is that specific enough of a yeah. question? Yeah, no it is. Well, it was the most difficult decision of my life, I think just because it was right at the apex of where those priorities come down to earth in practice. Um, and so, in some ways. In other ways, it was so clear that that was what God wanted me to do, that it was a case of me obeying rather than going, oh, yeah, you know. Um, the, the way it came about was so extraordinary. I wasn't looking to move, and it wasn't part of the, the five-year plan. Now, you planted a church in New England. Now, go to Bible church, mega church. Yay, you know. It wasn't the next step. Um, Rochelle, my wife, and I were talking one evening, and she said to me, Josh, I just pray, if you're ever meant to leave Trinity, you will just get headhunted, which is a strange comment, but that's one she made. Next morning, I happened to be downstairs by the phones at the church office, talking to some people there, and uh, the phone went, picked it up, you know, because I was there and having a good time chatting around, hi, you know. Trinity Baptist, and the guy says, you know, can I speak to Josh Moody? I say, this is he. And uh, he says, oh, this is so-and-so from College Church. We're interested in talking to you about, you know. And, and the combination of those two events, mm -hmm. though God is, I, I don't, <clears throat> you know, it's not making decisions based upon casting lots or something, though that has some biblical precedence too, um, but not one I would advocate um, before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, etc. Um, uh, it, it's not like that. It seemed to be what God was doing. It seemed to be a clear combination of his providence. And so then we went through the whole process, just as you described. How do you make those decisions? Where, where, where should I be putting my most significant strokes in? And we, I wrestled with that a lot. Um, but in the end, it came down to I think being obedient, that's where, what God wanted me to do. Um, 
And you had a, a general question behind that too, in terms of how you dis decide where to put your most significant strokes in ministry, right? Yeah, it, w it was just, you're obviously a gifted man. It's not to brown nose you or anything, but you can do multiple things, right? And God, God has, he's called you to very specific things, and you only have, I mean, you're a married man, you only have 40 hours during the day, and yet the people that need the gospel, the people in your church that need pastoring, et cetera, are, you know, the needs are enormous. Yeah. So how do you practically decide on a day-to-day -day basis what to put your efforts into? And maybe that's decided by your position and you have that advantage, I don't know. Well, I've made some pretty significant decisions already in my life, so to some extent it is decided, though I'm sure there'll be more to come in one way or another. Um, here's, here's my philosophy of guidance, which I think is really what it's getting to, though it's in a particular area. Because we want to do what God wants, and we presume that he knows what's best and where I can best be used, right? So, um, I, when I have a question that comes my way, first of all, what I do is I get a, a book from the Bible, 2 Timothy, Ephesians, Philippians, maybe a gospel, and I, write, I have a piece of paper, and I write at the top of the piece of paper what the decision is, and then I read through that book of the Bible, writing down which Bible verses speak directly to that situation. And I find far more times than I would have thought beforehand, the Bible actually tells me what I should do. So then it's no, you know, then it's no brainer. But it's an important process. I, I think we too often think the Bible is about spiritual things, and here's a practical decision. Now I've got to figure it out, rather than actually doing the hard work of trying to work out what the Bible says about this. So I do that. Then comes issues of prudence, wisdom. And the principle for me is. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. So in terms of my principle, I'm trying to figure out how I can, with the gifts that God has given me, and with the person that I am, how can I maximally advance the kingdom of God? That's the question. Seek first the kingdom of God. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I think it comes down to that. With the person that God has made me, the gifts that you've given me, how can I maximally advance the kingdom of God? And then, you know, that's a prudence question, just like it would be a worldly prudence question, how can I make most money? But we've got a very different principle. So how can I glorify God? Prudence. And for prudence, we don't have perfect wisdom, but we, we pray about it, or we think about it, or we do our pro and con sheets, we, we talk to our, not just our friends, so that's important, but also those in the church and in Christian ministry who maybe are mentoring us, encouraging us for their opinion. Doesn't mean they're always right, because you'll sometimes find they have different opinions, but we get what the management speak, they call a 360, you know, a, a panoramic view around the situation. And then at some point or other, here's the difficult thing, at some point or other, having done that, you've still got to make the call. Still got to decide, cut, you know, incision, decision, Got to cut. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And I think for that, so we've had looking in the Bible, seeing what it says, prudence. I think for that, we have to have a well-formed theology of God's sovereignty. That, you know, the heart of the king, he twists this way and that. And God's in charge. And so we, having done those things, we then take a step, believing that God is sovereign. So I, I, does that help? So I I'm not sure I think, oh, I've got all these gifts. How can I, I start with the Bible, then prudence, and then underneath I try and remember that God really is in charge of even my decisions. Yeah. 
Well, it, it takes time, and, but it can be done under God's sovereignty. So I think, you know, Paul's images of ministry, farming, uh, athletics, training, s- soldier, all of these are hard work, long time commitments. So a project like that is, is hard work, it's a long time, it's a commitment, but God can do it. And so what do you do? What you do, if you were called to a pastorate like that, is you would first of all love people. Whether they were liberals, um, fascists, uh, <clears throat> or anything in between, right? You would love them. So they, they would know that even if you disagree with them, you, it's not because you don't like them, you love them. It's because you do love them. You do like them. That's key. Um, you often see, I think, in Scripture how, how big a heart Paul had. He, he's just broken up when his churches are not doing what they should be doing. And that only really comes when you really care. And so you have to make the risk to care. Take the risk to care. So you love people. Um, then, within that context of, of shepherding heart... Um, you prioritize the preaching of God's word. So, I, I, you know, a church like that, hardly any church, even the most liberal, minds someone deciding, hey, let's go through the book of Ephesians together. That would be fun. I mean, hardly anyone who calls themselves a Christian is going to object, you know. So you just start doing it. You start preaching through the Bible in some kind of systematic way, and you trust that God's word will have impact. Uh, then you do some good mentoring. So you actively seek out men in the congregation um, because it's hard to mentor women. Your wife could do that, but you can't really do that. You, can, you need to pastor them, but it's hard to sit down with them at coffee at 11 o'clock at night and talk about their problems. You know, your wife could do that, but it's hard for you to do that. You need to shepherd them. But you, it, so you'd find some men with potential, just a small, a few good men, right, that you are going to disciple. Um, and how do you decide who those are? The, the acronym I use for that is one I was taught when I was doing mission work with InterVarsity, and they told me you should look for people who are faithful, available, and teachable, or otherwise fat, which is perhaps not very polite, but easy to remember. Faithful, available, and teachable. In other words, you don't look for the guy who's the most gifted, though that's good if that comes along. It's not like that's a bad thing. It's a great thing. But you're looking for people with the right heart. Faithful, available, teachable. You find a few good men like that and invest in them. So they get what you're talking about. So there you are. Everyone knows you love them. Even they don't like you, they know you love them. Uh, You're preaching the word uh, from the pulpit. And there are a few good men you're training up to be the next generation of leaders. Five or ten years, all being well, be a different church. I guess as a uh, follow-up to the essential point that you made in your message this morning about having confidence in the sufficiency of Scripture, um, has there been a time in your life or I guess particularly during ministry uh, where you've been in pastoral leadership where that confidence has been under attack by doubt or undermined by doubt? and um, doubt. Or yeah. by doubt, yeah. Um, or in... Uh, the lives of mentors, and how have you dealt with that, or how have you seen that dealt with? I mean, I, I, went, I went to, you know, some of the most postmodern secular universities on the face of the planet, like Cambridge, two degrees, and a Yale Research Fellowship at least, though not there formally studying. Research Fellowship, as Doug knows, just means you get to hang out and read books in libraries, so, which is fun. Um, but uh, I never really when I was doing that, got to a place when I felt there was a serious intellectual challenge to Christianity purely cognitively. And I think the reason for that is because of my background when, you know, I've got some very bright people around me who believed otherwise, and they always seemed to have an answer to the question when I was 15, 16, 18. And so when I got there, I just assumed there was one. So I I did some proactive things. This is why I tend to encourage people when they're studying at a secular university. Um, number one, you should never bury your doubts. So if we believe that God is true and his word is true, any question is a good question. 
So I was, bring your questions. There's nothing, that's how we find out stuff. So never bury your doubts. If people bury their doubts, what happens is they seem to be doing fine for a while, and then five, ten years later, they suddenly wake up and think, I'm not sure I believe this anymore. And they're no longer clear why, because there's this massive selection of skeletons in their closet that they cannot identify. So you never bury your doubts. What do you do with them? You try to answer them straight away. Probably 80%, you're a bright guy, love Jesus. 80% of the questions, you can answer straight away. What do you do with the 20%? 20%, write down a few of them, try and figure them out. That'll probably get you to 90%. You're a bright guy, you love Jesus, right? What do you do with the last 10%? Well, then you go and seek out a mentor who's been through it before and say, what do you do with those questions? That probably gets you to 95. What do you do with the last 5%? Well, you gradually try and figure them out over the years. That probably gets you to 97, 98%. Hey, I'm not sure I'm 98% certain I'm alive. <laughs> so, you know, philosophically. So if I have 98% certainty in God's word, I'm doing, I think I'm doing all right. So that, that's... Um, what, what, I, what I think I do find hard is when you're going through difficult times with God or in life, it's harder then not to say, I really trust you, God. And faith is really about trust, isn't it? So yeah, I can put it together intellectually, but the, the bottom line is when this happens to me or that happens to me in my personal life or ministry, and that's painful, can I trust God in that? So I think everyone has a battle of faith all the time. And that's, that's more what I find. I need, to work, I need to trust God in this. And there being any number of things like that in my life. And presumably there will be more, which is good for me, I'm sure. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk about how your, uh, your PhD training um, enhanced or contributes to your ministry as a pastor. Um, and then a second question, uh, how do you bridge the gap between your um, academic and intellectual interests and your, your ministry um, as a pastor? Yeah. I don't think everyone should do a PhD. I think it's probably good that some pastors have them. I don't think it means they're more elite than other pastors. I just think that it's probably good that in God's economy, there are some pastors who have PhDs. That's probably a good thing. I don't think everyone has to do them. Uh, for me, uh, it's been helpful because it's opened doors for ministry that otherwise probably would have been closed. So it's been an, an entrance ticket to certain conversations that probably otherwise I would not have been able to have and certain opportunities here, abroad, England, all sorts of places. Um, it, has also, it also gave me the opportunity to think about um, certain issues in ministry and in life and in philosophy, theology, at a very, very deep level. And what that does, I think, is it, it's like climbing one peak in a mountain range. And so you get to the top, and when you get to the top, you can survey the other peaks. You can't climb them all, but if you get to the top of one, or near the top of one, it allows you to have a, a little more of a panoramic view of what the issues are in other disciplines. And I found that very, very helpful, all sorts of times. You can sort of figure out where these things are going, how they get there, just because you've, you've made that journey once yourself. Um, I do think, though, trans transitioning to your other question, that it has its dangers. I mean, no one wants a pastor in the pulpit who's so above people's heads that you just can't. You think, well, he's bright, but I have no idea what he's talking about. I'm glad he's bright, but... Um, <laughs> And so getting the PhD was good. Um, I prayed every day that I would get my PhD in three years because I want to get on with ministry and not do it forever. So getting it was good, but I think not forgetting it. I mean, I'm always using it, but forgetting uh, being able to communicate at the bottom line -ish level, that's pretty important too. And that took me a while to transition. And you need to be able to do that. Um, but I, I, I think it's, it can be, I mean, so you read someone like Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, obviously, I've thought a lot about him at times. You get the sense with Edwards that when you're listening to his sermons or reading his sermons, it's like this, here's the thin end of the wedge that's coming towards you. 
but though he doesn't talk about it, he doesn't use lots of technical jar technological jargon at all, technical, technical jargon, theological jargon. Though he doesn't talk about it, you can get the feeling there's this massive weight of intellectual stuff that's coming your way, you know? And so that's kind of my ideal. Yeah, there's this thin end, I'll crack jokes, I'll, I'll, I'll use normal language, but, I, but behind that is a lot of weight. And I think what that means is that it drives deeper. So. I have a question, um, kind of a, coming out of a personal situation in seminary. I am not coming from, uh, I'm not in my homeland, if you will. I, um, I, I transplanted here. And in my context, I find myself at church a lot, at seminary a lot, and hanging out with seminary peers a lot. So I find myself around Christians a lot. And I think in your other context, it's probably easier for you to engage um, in non-Christians. But now that you're in Wheaton, mm. um, and you're pastoring in Wheaton, and I imagine your context around you, mostly Christians, as being uh, gospel-centered people, what, it, what does it look like for you um, to form relationships with non, non-Christians or, or to maintain them and, and, to, and to have that kind of ministry? Yeah. Um, well, this is where having kids is great. Because, uh, you know, if you, so our neighbors know I'm the senior pastor of College Church and maybe one or two of them go, but the rest don't and think it's kind of strange, but whatever. Um, but they know, but really our house is Sophia's house. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really a, their dad, you know, my children. And so that just normalizes it and enables me to build relationships with people in our neighborhood for the long term. So there's that aspect. The other thing is, when you're a pastor, I found, when you meet a non-Christian, and there are non-Christians in Wheaton, by the way. Um, when, when you meet a non-Christian, it's almost as if there's an immediate choice that person has to make. Do I never speak to this person again, or do I talk about Jesus? And it's a 50-50 toss-up, but you know, it means 50% of the time you get some really good conversations. So I think there's some advantages to being in the religious category as far as a non-Christian is concerned, because it if they want to talk about God, they'll talk to you about God. So it, it, I've, even Wheaton and New Haven and Cambridge, I've tended to find that as I've done more and more ministry and come more kind of like into the center of the camp, if you like, what it really means is the conversations I have with non-Christians tend to be much more um, decisive in terms of where they're at. And so it's important, which is great, but it's important for me that I'm having these long-term relationships with non-Christians so I remember all the hard work that it takes for someone to get there. And that, that's how I try and go about it. Um, I made a comment when I candidated at a college church that when, if I did come here, I'd need to find at least five pagans and hang out with them. And I certainly found more than five pagans, but you know, it is an intention to keep having those. And I think the kids are the way to, for me at my stage of life, that's the way to hang out with them. Okay, our time is up uh, for today, but we will be here again on Thursday, and uh, we'll have another meal to offer. And uh, anyway, thank you so much for coming. Let's express our appreciation. To you.